I'm thinking I've now stalled long enough that people can hear me and I can begin. Is that true, Skip? So, again, thank you all for being here today to help celebrate John. We're here to celebrate Dr. John Watt, the man and his career. I want to call out some of the highlights and to offer a toast. After that, we'll have cake and it will be served. You can go get pieces of it as people speak. And others will come up and speak about John and then he'll have his turn at a rebuttal. <laughs> I must begin by acknowledging someone who is not here today. When we began to talk to Dr. Watt about what part of the Arboretum he would like us to name for him, I had a partner in this adventure. Along with Marilyn Montgomery, she and I took John on a cart ride, just like the one I did today, to offer possibilities. We questioned him. We teased him, we cajoled him. That partner was Sarah Reichert, John's former student and successor as director here. As most of you know, Sarah was in South Africa a month ago when she suffered a brain aneurysm and died. Her sudden passing has been a shock to all of us, but we all knew that she would have wanted us to keep going today. So please, as we talk about John, hear her voice, too, as we speak. She was so proud that we were going to be honoring him. It seems to me that there are three themes that run throughout John's career. His love of plants, his love of learning, and his love of people. His great gift is the way that he connects them all together. Many of you know that John grew up on a farm in Ohio, the fifth generation on the Watt family farm in Clyde, Ohio. John is proud of his heritage and his family heirlooms and farm artifacts are stuffed everywhere in every corner of his house to prove it. On the family farm, Dr. Watt kept chickens. How trendy of him. <laughs> Truly an early harbinger of his future in urban farming and urban horticulture. Who knew that keeping chickens in the city would be all the rage? When my daughter moved her family in with me last winter, her coop and her flock came along too. John, would you be willing to take a few? <laughs> He went on to Ohio State and Cornell University where he got his master's and PhD in ornamental horticulture. That is where he began developing an innovative agricultural outreach program, including leading a 3,000 member 4-H program. And it was his work there that led him to a position at Purdue University where he developed the most comprehensive adult continuing education of its kind in the country. When UW was starting the Center for Urban Horticulture, they recruited him to be its first faculty member to continue his magic touch of connecting people to plants and teaching them about them. We all know the place of athletics at UW. Wasn't that a nice game Friday? <laughs> but do you know that second to athletics under John the horticulture program became UW's second largest outreach program to the public. Way to go, John. <laughs> Others will speak to his time as director of the Arboretum and his leadership in the adoption of the master plan, which still guides what we do here. It's so clear that he loves this place. I will just say that 15 years after the adoption of the master plan, its vision and plan for the future remain fresh, inspiring, and a practical map for what to do. What an amazing achievement. 
but there are many other things to know about Dr. Watt. He loves to take care of people, and many of you know him from his church and good work that he does there, driving people to appointments, helping them when they're sick. He loves to teach, and many of you know him as a teacher and mentor. We receive so many tributes from his former students who couldn't be here, from as far away as Manitoba in the north and Florida in the south. I hope they didn't learn the same things, John. <laughs> he loves color, as anyone who has seen the bold colors and textures of his new home garden can attest. Hey, look at how he's dressed today. <laughs> John is not a saint, as he admonished me to tell you. John loves attention, doesn't he now? He just loves to be fussed over. Sarah and the team and I had a hard time getting him to make decisions. He so loved being courted. Can't you just see him? How about another phone call? Another lunch? Another Manhattan? Oh, and he does love his Manhattans. He is one of the few people still with us who relishes a three Manhattan lunch. I know. Because that's how Sarah, Marilyn, and I finally see the deal. But even more than his Manhattans, John loves to be in charge. As I planned this program, people kept calling me saying, did you know that John called and he wants me to do this? <laughs> well, no, I didn't. He was impish. See it on his face? He was charming. He was fun. But he was determined to do it his way. And I'm pretty sure that he pretty nearly has. I want to sum up with a quote from one of his former students, Jamie Gibbs. Quote, how appropriate that the Arboretum is naming a path for John, considering the professional, moral, and spiritual path he has guided his followers down for years. So please, everyone, with your glass, raise it up and join me in a toast to Dr. Watt. Passionate educator, visionary leader, caring mentor, and dear friend to the Arboretum and all of us here. Cheers. In keeping with the fact that we have three partners here, our next speaker is from the city. He's Michael Shiyosaki. He's worked with John here in the Arboretum and on many other issues in his life. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the city of Seattle and the mayor of the city of Seattle, John, um, and I, some days I have a few connections there. It's just my pleasure to uh, to be able to help dedicate John Wattway in honor of Dr. Watt. I'm Michael Chiyosaki, and I'm with Seattle Parks and Recreation. I've known John for about 20 years now, and you know I think of John as a friend and a mentor, a colleague and an educator, an advocate, and a storyteller. Most of us know that uh, John has played a pivotal role in the strong partnership that makes up the Washington Park Arboretum. As the director of the Arboretum, John embraced uh, the, 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 the park's special role as a place of education, conservation, and recreation. And um, sometimes very complicated at times, as uh, Dr. Watt would say, he always touted the importance of the strong relationship between the university, the Arboretum Foundation, and the city. So, um, so much of what we see today, especially here at Pacific Connections, is uh, 
is this renewal of the, uh, of the Arboretum. And it's really been a result of uh, John's work to shepherd through this master plan that you've heard about. And the master plan was aptly titled, <laughs> Renewing the Washington Park Arboretum. Through seven long years, John was instrumental in guiding the master plan through the long planning process, gaining consensus and public support for the plan. The long-range planning effort has and continues to transform the Arboretum today, emphasizing modern eco-geographic exhibits like Pacific Connections and better access that we can see here right before our very eyes. John has always been a passionate advocate for the Arboretum, and it's been an honor to work with someone who is uh, both historian and visionary. As a historian, John knows where the proverbial bodies are buried here in the Arboretum, <laughs> and there are a few. And um, as you know, John really helps keep the history of this place alive. But he's also um, helped paint the picture of how much more this Arboretum can be. So naming this, uh, this segment of trail for, for Dr. Watt is just one small way of honoring John and his incredible contributions here at the Washington Park Arboretum. So on behalf of the city, John, we just can't thank you enough. So our second city person actually works for Michael at the city and is a good friend of John's, Andy Sheffer. I understand Andy has written a poem to John. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. John, <laughs> when pressures of momentum don't make obligations sway, you stop to help your arboretum or another on the way. For solutions you seek history, learn what matters from the past. It becomes a moral story to seek harmony at last. When the past reveals a curve and status quo gets too old, comp complacency hits a nerve and John steps into the fold. <laughs> Holding court with confidants at Burger Master, of course, John Watt listens to the wants and looks for grace to endorse. In time, reason does prevail. Stormy wind swells up fresh air. What merit does change entail to serve public need with care? Regarding human kindness, John services those in need. He is one of mindfulness. Gardens are his tool indeed. Thank you, John. John's kids could not be here uh, today, but that didn't mean that they thought that they should not be participating. And they said some remarks, which um, Chris is going to share with us, Chris Stollery from the Arboretum Foundation. A couple of thoughts about Dr. Watt from those who know him. <laughs> Many of you here today probably know that most of the career accomplishments of Dr. Watt. Many of them have already been covered here. But we, his three children, Chris, Tim, and Holly, thought we might add just a few nuggets from his family side of the horticultural lifetime experiences. <laughs> uh, just to give you a little bit of insight as to what it's like to have a father whose entire life is dedicated to the study and betterment of God's green gift to nature. Please do us a quick favor here. Everyone just take a quick look standing at him up here. Is he wincing yet? <laughs> okay. Well, to start with growing up, Dad was always taking pictures of grass. Yes, <laughs> just plain grass. Lots and lots of pictures of blades of grass. In those days, they were called slides. And you know what? Most of those pictures are probably still in boxes in his office. They are there, just in case 
he might need to refer to them 50 years later. <laughs> so the next time you are at one of those big garden home tours or dinners, please remember to ask him to break those babies out. <laughs> hours and hours of entertainment, guaranteed. <laughs> Another memory were the family vacations. You see, most family vacations included garden tours. And you know how kids love those. <laughs> of course, gardening lectures were sometimes included as well. In fact, son Tim and daughter Holly, while here in Seattle on a vacation, were once asked to attend a two, uh, full two-hour lecture with Dad, where every single slide at the lecture was a dip different type of rhododendron. <laughs> and you know what? To this day, both Tim and Holly despise rhododendrons. <laughs> this is one of four pages, but your kids love you. Thank you. So, of course, John's career here has been at the University of Washington. And so, and so we've asked in Sarah's stead uh, to have Dr. Tom Hinckley, who has been his colleague for many years at the Center for Urban Horticulture and here in the Arboretum, to come speak from that perspective. Tom. I feel very unable to speak uh, because I miss having Sarah here because I know this is one of Sarah's dreams. And the only satisfaction I have is realizing that one of her dreams is being fulfilled at this moment. Um, I know John since he first uh, showed up at the University of Washington, and but I wanted to go back and see what the letter of invitation, the job offer that he received, <laughs> and there's some interesting wording in it. Uh, Professor Howard Tukey, who was the first director of the Center for Urban Horticulture and the Washington Park Arboretum, is here today, and, and these are his words. So he's trying to sell the University of Washington to John. John's at Purdue. John has a very successful career at Purdue. Purdue is an outstanding agriculture university that really loves and does extension really well. So the letter says, cannot promise you the facilities, students, or the systems you enjoy at Purdue. <laughs> then there's a however. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm on a path of a new and bold vision for the Seattle area and for the University of Washington, and that's to begin a program in urban horticulture, and I see you as leading the outreach and educational aspects of that, and that's indeed what John has, has done. His legacy here, not only his legacy in the Arboretum, but his legacy at the University of Washington at the Center for Urban Horticulture is to open to the broad public uh, what plants are all about and an enthusiasm for plants in an urban space and an enthusiasm for just knowing and learning about plants in itself. And I think we are to congratulate John for that kind of legacy. There's one other thing. So the facilities he was first in was a little bit like uh, a ramshackled shed in somebody's backyard. <laughs> and with this space, the program emerged and grew. Uh, a new facility developed where now the Center for Urban Horticulture is. And no sooner had John gotten his slides into that facility <laughs> that someone set it on fire. Oh. <clears throat> and that was back in 2001. And, but John Marshall, staff, faculty, and students with lots of other folks, and rebuilt Merrill Hall. And the new Merrill Hall now is both a legacy to what John did, but also a legacy to Sarah. So I think we all should, if, if you haven't been to Merrill Hall, go, go visit there. It's a, real, it's a real legacy. So the next phase I got involved with John was uh, Clem Hamilton left as director of the Center for Urban Horticulture. I stepped in as an, on an interim 
part. And one of the things I've learned in life when you step in as an interim, the word interim is not the operative word. <laughs> uh, our relationship lasted for five plus years where not only did we work together on the master plan, but we worked together on rebuilding Merrill Hall. We worked together on maintaining the kind of program. And the sort of ability of the university doesn't apply to football coaches, but the ability of the university to, to have continuity of excellence, I think is really substantial and really amazing. And John is obviously a strong part of that kind of continuity. So I want to congratulate John for not only serving the academic and research interests of the university to the highest level, but also by bringing people, by making Center for Urban Horticulture, the Washington Park Arboretum, and now UW Botanic Gardens what it is today. John, I congratulate you. Thank you so much, Tom. So um, now we have Tom DeLuca and Fred Hoyt from the School of Forest and Environmental Resources and the University of Washington Botanic Gardens. Fred is serving in that interim role as Sarah's successor. Um, Tom was Sarah's boss. And they are John's honor guard to bring him up here to see what he's going to say about what we all have just done here today. Dr. Watt. I know. It's nice to have a lot of Van Whites here. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's just uh, unbelievable. And uh, I have to say, the first thing is, it's a great afternoon. Now, you say, it's a great afternoon. I couldn't hear you. Okay, because I'm a little deaf. Really. All right, so almost exactly three years ago, uh, we stood here, right here for the dedication and opening of this extraordinary two-acre New Zealand garden, the largest type of garden that I think is out of sight of New Zealand. So we are very fortunate. Maybe we should get New Zealand to partly move here. <laughs> three years later, here we are still alive and still able to be a part of this. Yesterday, you heard about my daughter, but when I talked to her a couple of days ago, I said to her, uh, I have to give this talk. And she's like, and I'm like, well, I don't know what really to say. And she goes, oh, come on, Dad, suck it up. <laughs> you know, you're never short for words. <laughs> And you always shoot first and ask questions later. So today I'm going to shoot first and then we can ask questions a little later. When I looked over the guest list, and now when I look over the crowd, I feel a little bit like um, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn when they feigned their drowning and they came back to their own funeral. Mm. And I'm like standing here looking at people from all over my life of, of 50 years or more, some of us. And I'm still here talking to you. It's no funeral. I'm still alive. <laughs> As uh, Paige told you, this idea and this party was spun by three wonderful ladies. And uh, as they said, they coerced, co coerced me and kept talking about what place do you like, what plant do you like. And to be honest, I like the whole damn place. But they insisted I had to name a spot. Well, because this is part of the plan that came out of the master plan, because I've been to New Zealand <clears throat> many times, I have great friends that are Kiwi friends. And because of my love for the Bollards and what they started in this arena, I ended up in the middle of this pathway, and I'm going to be really happy to be there. 
And I'm glad of there. So I hope you, each and every one of you, will come and walk the path many times <clears throat> with and without me. It'll be a great pleasure. And you've heard that um, I have a lot of connection with the people in the, in the community. And um, some people uh, called me, a couple people called me and said, my God, isn't that wonderful? You're getting a, na you're getting a road named after you. <laughs> and I went, oh, come on now. It's just a pitted little gravel path. <laughs> and then you know, some of you, Dan Hinkley, who is a former graduate student of mine, he comes up to me and he says, I've been waiting to walk all over you all my life. <laughs> Um, Sir Daniel is in Cambodia or Ireland or some damn place like that collecting plants. And when he gets back, we're going to walk the trail. And my grin is going to be, we're walking on this trail now. You explain that comment to me. In reality, I really believe that it takes, that you only get honors like this after you have a village of people to support you. A village of workers, staff, volunteers, and friends. And <clears throat> to me, this is your honor as well as mine. In late May of 1957, an 18-year-old farm boy from Clyde, Ohio, <laughs> gave his valedictorian address. It was from the poem, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow road, word, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as far, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally, equally lay, in leaves no step had broken away. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I would ever come back that way. At this stage of my life, I look back on my legacy, my family, my friends, my life, my village. I have a grandfather, fifth removed, who received an honor from the King of Prussia. I'm wearing the wedding ring of my grandfather. I have you here. What a damn village could anybody ever want besides this one? You heard that my early professional career was back in the Midwest. Certainly, that propelled me to get here. But I remember the day I drove into Seattle, April 23rd, 1981. My blue Buick U-Haul across the Cascades, gleaming blue water in Lake Washington. I said, wow. Now I wonder, if I didn't own the adventure, would I have turned around? I don't think so. <laughs> it's been a good one. Three years ago in this spot, I was start, struck by the words of the Consul General of New Zealand, Liam Grice, who said, we may be outside in an urban forest, but actually we're standing in a cathedral. Look down, the grass is your carpet. Look up. The sky is your ceiling. Look around you. The trees are your walls. And the plants and the artifacts are the things that make it for real. Now before I close, there's a few people I'd like to, to call out. If I had my time, I'd call out each one of you, but we'd never get to the key. <laughs> and the Manhattans and the Champagne. The <laughs> they promised me eventually I'll get a Manhattan. <laughs> I, or more, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I certainly got it called uh, Dr. Harold Tukey, and I don't know. Harold, are you still here? Where are you? Back, where, wave your hand. Where are you? Okay. Dr. Harold Tukey has finished his life. Founding director of the Center for Important Culture. If you hadn't brought me here, I wouldn't be here today. I was worried when I came here. I didn't know anybody. Two people. I had a dreams that I died, and there was a funeral, unlike Buck Finn and Tom Sawyer. Nobody came to the funeral because nobody knew me in Seattle. Yeah. Holy cow, look at this today. I am just so blessed. I'm certainly humbled by the footsteps of those who have walked here as leaders. We could order Hanley Mulligan. Dale Cole, Harold Tukey, Clemel Hamilton, Tom Hinckley. Certainly those that have followed as directors that are still somewhere. Sandra Lear, David Maverly, Sarah Reichert, now Fred Hoyt. I would say to you in charge from the university, city, whoever you are, you've now got a challenge. You're going to have to find somebody that can fit in our shoes. <laughs> and we have big shoes. But it'll be fun to leave this legacy to someone that we don't know who will be here, hopefully within the year. I would also like to acknowledge Betty Miller. As many of you know, one of the grand doms of the horticulture world. And Paige mentioned that I'm not a saint. Well, I want you to know that I was interviewed and approved by Betty Miller before I came. <laughs> And that happened on my first interview with Betty Miller when I successfully matched her three double scotches before dinner. And when I came for my interview, she was in the front row with a big smile on her. I'd like to acknowledge my family. You heard from them. They are my support whenever I need them. And I wish they could be here today. But I'd also like to acknowledge that I bet there's not any, many people that you get to this stage of life and you can say that your high school prom date is in the audience. Put your hand up. Her daughter, Jenny Marion, is now my adopted daughter. And then there's another one, Alexandria. I'm not sure if you're, are, are you still here? She was here earlier. So I can't have my own kids, but I got a lot of other kids. And I enjoy them. I would like to uh, acknowledge, as we heard, the partnerships of the city, the superintendents, Holly Miller and Ken Bounds that I worked with in my career. I certainly think about those people in the staff. Woody Wilkinson, Ken, Kerry Lassiter, Pat Elder, Don Harris, Fritz Hedges, and now certainly Michael, Andy, and all the current crew. You've just been a wonderful group to be with. And then there's 30 some years plus of our Freedom Foundation presidents, which I can't possibly name. But I do need to call out um, Dwayne Kelly because he was the force that got us started on the master plan and propelled us into the future. And every one of you since, there's a number of you here in this audience today. I really want to say thank you to Deborah. Where are you? I see you smiling, but Deborah Andrews, the CEO of the foundation, through all those interesting master plan meetings. And we would come back to the office on our hands and knees. But by golly, we succeeded, didn't we? Thank you, Deborah. This is for you, too. I will quit eventually. <laughs> I must also acknowledge the UW people, Dean Drew, Dean Bear, and of course a lot of staff. There's so many of you here today, I just can't possibly name you because I'll forget. Fran, uh, Carrie, Fred, David, and the crew for making this place so wonderful. Van Bobbitt, Kirkendall, Becky, I mean, you're everywhere. It's the village. Uh, Cynthia and Peter. I mean, all of, so many people had little parts all the years that we played here. 
somehow as you go through life, you also know that there are sometimes the challenges of health. And you don't get to be this old and be as happy and as um, you know, bright without the help of people. I want to acknowledge Cal, my trainer. Put your damn hand up, Cal. <laughs> this is a young man that he keeps me going three times a week, makes me work, sweat, and tells me, you are not going to die. <laughs> <laughs> lives matter, Cal, don't they? All lives. Okay. So anyway, coming back to the last road travel, the last verse says, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I would like to say that I was given a, a, a poem or a writing when I retired here by the people at Portugal, Portugal who, who established this uh, master plan, and it goes something about, blessed is he who plants trees under which he does not sit. <laughs> I think that is the legacy that all of us who love this place will do. Lastly, I would like to thank Paige and her crew, Marilyn, certainly Sarah, who's not here, and wanted to be here so badly for all the work and for this most marvelous day. In the final straw, as long as you're alive, they never let you quit working. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed, I retired officially, what, 10 or 12 years ago? Sometimes I think, geez. Anyway, I have agreed with Iris and Ted Wagner, which I think you're, put your hands up over there, yes. We are going to lead the campaign in honor and memory of Sarah to start the new education bill that she wanted so very much. And so it is, party time. But we have one more item to fill up yet. And all I can say is, God bless all of you, my village, my friends, my family. Thank you. Okay. At my request, I've asked Jeremy Matthias, who has become a friend of mine over the last few years, He's the choir director, or the director of the choir of the sound, also associate director of, and a big cheese in the music program at St. Mark's Cathedral, and he's going to close the program. When you walk through a storm, keep your chin up high And don't be afraid of the dark At the end of the storm is a golden sky And the sweet silver song of a lark Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, through your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope, with your heart, and you'll never walk Keep your chin up high And don't be afraid of the dark 
At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. You'll Chris, where's Chris? Here. Chris has the guest book. Anyone who has not signed, John gets to keep that as a treasure of today, so please do. And of course, we have cake. Uh, please enjoy the cake. Please enjoy the friendship of all of your friends who are here today who love the Arboretum and love Dr. John Watt. You know, I, when I first came, someone said to me, do you know Dr. Watt? And I said, yes, he's one of our Arboretum treasures. And ever since, he's Dr. Treasure. So, <laughs> salute to Dr. Treasure. Enjoy.